right, great. Let's take just a moment together. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our message for this morning. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be here in this place. We pray the things we do and say here would be beneficial for our faith, would edify and encourage one another, but also would acknowledge you and lift you up. We pray that you'd help to compel us to even greater service and that our life of faith and faithfulness would be evidenced, that the Lordship of Jesus would be apparent to all, and that the hope of the gospel, the light of the gospel, would be shown to those who have yet uh, recognized their need for Christ. Thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to approach your word and to do so in a way that allows you to do your effectual work in us. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is the final message in the series entitled Stephen's Defense. And we've been going through Acts chapter 7 where Stephen, this young man, has been more or less placed on trial. He's been given an opportunity to give defense of his behavior, the things that he's been doing in uh, the early church. The scriptures tell us that the Jewish leadership was resistant to the message of Christ. They did not recognize Jesus. So what Stephen is doing now, rather than defending himself personally because he feels like uh, there's a better opportunity here, a greater cause that could be affected, what Stephen has done is he has turned the focus from himself and he has given a historic review of those who've come before them in Jewish faith and how uh, he's highlighted then what God has been doing in preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. This morning we're going to continue, we're going to look in Acts chapter 7, we're going to pick up with verse 44 and we're going to read uh, a few verses through this account of Stephen and it's, it's going to come in about three different components here. So we're going to begin with that first portion of the text. Acts chapter 7, verse 44 through 50. The Bible here says, Our fathers, this is Stephen speaking, Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build me, says the Lord? Or what kind of place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? So here Stephen is bringing now, kind of to a final account, all of the things he's talked about. He's led them through some accounts of the patriarchs and their faithfulness and their sacrifice and God's promise to them which was fulfilled. And he's been highlighting God's faithfulness throughout all of this. He's been stressing the reality that there's hardship, there's struggle, there's sacrifice, there's loss. But God is always faithful through all of it. God's accomplishing his purpose. And here now, in this final testimony, he says, listen, our fathers, our forefathers, had with them the very presence of God. And they recognized they wanted a permanent dwelling place for God. Not just that tabernacle of testimony, a place that, that was a reminder for the people and a temporary dwelling place. They wanted a permanent dwelling place. David appealed on behalf of uh, to the Lord to have this opportunity to build this temple, but his son Solomon was the one who built it. And now the Jewish people are in this audience knowing all these things. Stephen is drawing them to a point to say, listen, they had God's presence in, in a visual representation and in, in a place that was used for worship. And yet, and yet they rebelled. The scripture tells us of, of what we're going to talk about this morning with regard to the condition of our spiritual receptivity toward God. And it uses a phrase often called hardness of heart. This is what Stephen is, is about to really fully impress on these people. To have a hard heart in the scripture means that you are increasingly resistant to God's word. It's a persistent rebellion, lack of recognition or observance of what God has said. That can change. 
This is not a permanent condition. It's dependent upon the individual. But the Bible speaks about the idea of searing our conscience and developing a callousness to the leading of God into His Word such that we close out His, His Word and we do not in any way make ourselves receptive or available to it. We're cautioned against that and over and over we're told we can change the condition by surrendering to God and allowing Him to do His work in us and that's where Stephen is in this situation. He said there's good and bad in our history. Our forefathers did some wonderful things. God never failed. He did exactly what He said He would do. And yet in spite of this, some of our forefathers rebelled. They went against God. And they suffered the consequences as a result. That's referred to as hardness of heart. Now the scripture also refers to this as being stiff-necked. Uh, many of you have that medical condition. I do as well. <laughs> uh, it's a little different than this. This is a spiritual stiff-necked uh, condition. And the Bible describes it as being someone who is obstinate, someone who has closed their ears to God's Word, someone who has, as the Bible phrases, an uncircumcised heart. In other words, they are unwilling to be identified to the core by the Lordship of Jesus and someone who is a rebel. Now, the idea of being hard at heart or calloused in the heart or uncircumcised in the heart, the idea of being stiff-necked is presented in, in Scripture in a few different ways. And that phrasing is used over and over again to describe the same condition of rebelliousness. For those of you who have worked with horses, trying to work with them, you perhaps know what it's like when you have a horse that's not wanting to take the bridle or fighting the bit. You have to work with them and sometimes they can make it really difficult to be able to get the bridle on them. Maybe you've worked with other animals, like a mule, and you've tried to set them to the plow in like manner. You have to be able to get the bridles on them and, and have their harness attached in a way that they're able to be used. The Bible using this phrase, like an oxen who's moving away from those implements, rather than being submissive and allowing the master to place the yoke on them, they're fighting it. Now, going from farm animals then to the point the Scripture is making here in the words of Stephen, there's a spiritual application. And it begs for us to ask, am I individually moving away from God? Am I the one who's resistant when it comes to Him trying to bridle me or rein me in? When he's doing his good work and pruning away those things that are not pleasing to him or honorable to him that are not beneficial to me or others, it might be painful, it might be difficult, it requires me to submit. Am I submitting to it? Or am I saying in my heart, in my mind, I know better than the word? I've heard it phrased a lot. I know the Bible says this, but... And it breaks my heart when people professing to be Christians say that. Because what they're really saying is, I know what the Word of God says, and I don't care. I've heard that said with regard to relationships. I've heard it said with regard to discipline. I've heard it said with regard to spiritual instruction and spiritual principles. Over and over again, I know what the Bible says, but... And what that's doing is it's elevating yourself above the authority of the Word. And in so doing, we are stiff-necked. Now, what's the outcome of all this? Well, if you've been reading ahead in Acts chapter 7, you already know the outcome of what's happening here. You know, Stephen is presenting this as an opportunity for the hearing audience to respond correctly. He's saying, listen, this is not a lifelong, unchanged circumstance. In fact, the Bible even impresses upon us, we can train our heart and mind... And we can change in a lot of ways by submitting to Christ and His Lordship. The Bible speaks about what has happened here in, in Stephen's testimony in a way that, that compels us to understand the idea of submission is evidenced in what we do, not just what we say. In Luke chapter 15, verses 27 and following, here Jesus says, speaking of an account that, that uh, was happening, uh, with Lazarus and uh, Abraham. He said, I beg you, Father, 
Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so they'll not come also to this place of torment. Abraham said, very important phrasing here, they, the living, have the prophets and Moses, or Moses and the prophets as is cited, let them hear them. This is the same thing, in essence, Stephen is saying when he said, Our forefathers had the tabernacle of testimony with them in the wilderness. It was laid out, built exactly the way God revealed it to Moses. It was a representation of God's presence with them. They had that and rebelled. Here Jesus is using this account and he's saying, Lazarus, now there with Abraham, this rich man, begging that Lazarus be sent back to the living to warn his five brothers. And Abraham said, they essentially have the testimony of God. Let them listen to that. Let them hear Moses, the law. Let them listen to the prophets where God was speaking through these messengers to tell these people what they need to do. But he responds and said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Not enough to have God's stated explicit will, his word. Here this rich man says, Oh, no, no. Give them a sign. And Abraham replied, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. That's what Stephen is saying here, essentially. They had the presence of God with them, and they were still obstinate. They were still hard-hearted, stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart, with closed ears, rebellious. They didn't listen, and Jesus even rose from the dead. And in that audience directly, Stephen is calling them urgently to turn from that behavior to surrender and be obedient to God's expectations found in Christ so they could be forgiven. That's what God's been working toward all this time, but they fail to recognize it. Scripture goes on in Acts chapter 7 to speak about how hard-hearted they really were, how stiff-necked they really were, beginning with verse 51. The Scripture says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. So now he's appealing to the bad behavior of those who went before them. And he's saying you are falling in the same air of ways. He goes further. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? A messenger of God. Those, um, they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. He's saying to them directly, if you disobey, you've got blood on your hands. You who received the law as ordained by angels and did not keep it. And here is really the crux of the matter. Christian faith teaches and accepts the, the scripture as God's word. There's a modern idea that's taught, it's dangerous, that's taught in, in many churches today, and that is that the Bible contains God's Word. In other words, there are bits and pieces of it that are absolutely God's Word, but then there are bits and pieces that are not. Well, that is absolutely, completely a horrific doctrine that is not of God. Because then it begs for us to answer the question, who subjectively gets to choose the parts that are of God and the parts that are not? Long ago... Saints affirmed what had been, as the Scripture teaches us in Jude, once for all delivered to the saints, the Scriptures. It's evidenced over and over again in many ways. And it either is God's Word, worthy of our acknowledgement and submission, or it is not. There is no middle ground. And Stephen is saying to his direct audience, bravely, courageously, at risk of his own life, he is saying, you have now fallen into the same error pattern your forefathers did if you don't keep the word of God. By your own testimony, he says, you proclaim it to be uh, given, endorsed, provided by angels, and yet you don't keep it. Well, let's go just a little bit further here and let's think about what we can do then in a precautionary way to keep us from falling in that same trap. 
Because again, Stephen's appeal was one to cause people to turn from that behavior so that God could be honored. That means there's opportunity for us to do the same. In the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 12, it tells us that we should be very cautious because there's a condition common among the family of men. Hebrews 3, verses 12 and following, says, Take care, brothers, that you are not, uh, that you, or that they're not, rather be. Let me back up. Take care, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Two things here. It is possible to have an unbelieving heart. That means it's possible to have a believing heart as well. There's hope here. Now, as is often the case, the Bible will focus on something that is to our detriment, but it urges, it compels us to receive the positive so we can avoid the negative consequence. So if it's possible to have an evil, unbelieving heart, it is possible then to have a pure, righteous, believing heart. And he says, if you fall into that first category, one that is evil and unbelieving, you will fall away from the living God. So by converse, we know, if we have a righteous heart, which urges and compels us to be closer to God, we'll not be falling away by our behavior. Scripture goes on. Encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you know one of the most detrimental things in a Christian's life? Avoiding opportunity of interaction, fellowship, worship with other Christians. I know that, that there are a lot of circumstances that can keep someone from being able to participate in the assembly that are legitimate, and I, I understand that. But sloth, being undisciplined, or having no desire, those are not valid in the eyes of God. There might be some urgency with regard to a pressing circumstance or condition that would prevent us from assembling, but if we say it's not that important, then we have the potential of developing a hard heart. And we need to be cautious of that. That's why the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling together. Why? Because it's in that environment, while it's still called today, while we still have heart, beat, and breath, there is still the opportunity for us to encourage one another toward righteous living. He goes a little further here and says, uh, not just in encouraging one another, oh, turned it off, not just encouraging one another, but he says, we have, as believers, become partakers of Christ if... Powerful two-letter word. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they provoked me. It's easy for us to allow little things to intervene to cause us to veer from the course, which can potentially cause us to have a hard heart, but we're urged cautiously to avoid this. He goes a little bit further. He's saying, not only are there those who participate actively in this type of behavior, but there are those who passively sit back and lend endorsement of that behavior. In the book of Romans, the first chapter, verse 28 and following, Scripture says, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, un loving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give a hearty approval to those who practice them. It is possible to excuse our behavior, to reason on our own, well, I have a legitimate reason why I can't do whatever God's asking me to do, which is a sign, a precautionary sign for us, a symptom of a hard heart. But it's easy for us to justify that and become, although we know the word and what he expects of us, to become someone who is endorsing something opposed to what God has said. Oh my goodness, in the modern church there's all kinds of examples of this. 
with regard to structures of leadership or those who are involved in leadership with regard to the very purpose and function of the church rather than a consumerist kind of mentality of me, 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 me. The Bible focuses us to others and honoring God and serving. The modern church has many trip points, but she's still the bride of Christ and God still finds honor and glory in her and we as a part of the body of Christ must be compelled to surrender fully, to be obedient to the teaching and hold fast so that our heart doesn't harden. So that we don't become, as the Bible describes, those who not only participate in but lend approval of those bad behaviors. There's one more thing that I want to share with you. And that is that Stephen provided an opportunity for those in the audience that day to agree with God. To enter into an agreement with God and receive the benefits of that agreement. Today we have the same opportunity. The book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 17 and following says, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you've been taught and have been taught in Him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. There is still opportunity for our hearts to be softened, to be changed, and for our life to be molded and patterned more like Jesus. The unfortunate circumstance in the immediate circumstance of Stephen's testimony was that much of the crowd didn't listen. In Acts chapter 7, verses 54 and following, Scripture says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. The Bible actually speaks about the idea of being pricked at the heart. They were, they were jarred, and they quickly became angry. They took it as a personal offense, rather than recognizing how they had personally offended God. They heard this, were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The crowd then cried out with a loud voice, covering their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. This is the mob. Boy, we can understand how the mob operates. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would later convert to Christian faith and be responsible through the leading of the Holy Spirit for providing us with the majority of books in the New Testament. He was known as Paul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the name of the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling on his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. The Bible's phrasing for his death. Here's a man who had opportunity to save his own neck. <laughs> he could have offered some kind of an excuse. He knew the Jewish structure. He knew their heritage and their traditions. He could have offered some sort of, of parentheses that would have helped them to respond to him in a better way, but he didn't. He didn't sell out the other fellow believers in Christ. He took his opportunity at the very cost of his own life to exalt the message of Jesus and the redemption that God offers us through Jesus. He was saying to them, don't be guilty of hardening your hearts. We know where that leads and God was angered by them in the wilderness. Don't do that. But instead surrender to Jesus and allow him to do his good work in you. We don't know exactly how many in the crowd rushed him. It sounds like a big mob. Perhaps there were others who had that seed embedded in them and later it produced the opportunity for them to be able to come to an obedient faith in Christ. We don't really know. But what we do know is that Stephen 
saw the message of Christ as more valuable than even his own life. Now I'm left with a question. Where were the other believers who could have rushed in to help Stephen with his defense? You know, when we're in a community of believers, we're here for a variety of reasons, and, and one of those reasons is to come alongside someone when they're dealing with a circumstance like this. Perhaps they were fearful of losing their own life or property or their own standing in the community. Perhaps they scattered and ran. Maybe there were some, the scripture doesn't even talk about, who were there, who were encouraging Stephen while he was giving his testimony. We don't really know. Perhaps a better question is, where would we be in that environment? Do we recognize the value of the gospel in the same way Stephen did? Here's what I want to bring us to in terms of an opportunity for resolution. God allows you the free will opportunity to choose. You can allow your heart to be formed and molded and shaped by God, or you can be rebellious in disbelief and follow your own course. Here's the thing. God does not excuse us from the consequences when we choose to go against Him. As I mentioned this morning in the communion meditation, when we have surrendered to Christ and are found in Him, the Bible tells us Jesus takes the consequence, the burden, the debt, the penalty, and He bears it Himself. So it's a choice laid out clearly. Follow our own, our own course, as the Bible describes, being stiff-necked, hard-hearted, or surrendering to Christ. On our own, we bear the consequence of our own decision with no forgiveness, no redemption. Or in Christ, even in spite of the fact that we fail and sin in Christ, we're offered redemption. How hard is your heart this morning? Let's pray together. Father, we appreciate so much the working of your spirit, the way your word is able to penetrate our hearts and minds and help to compel us to help to agree in recognizing Jesus as Lord. I know there are all kinds of things around us that compel us to have certain uh, absolute signs and things of that nature, and you've provided so many evidences, and yet this matter is a matter of faith. Help us to hold to that faith immovable, so that in our resolve and in our action, you will be exalted and you'll do your good work in us. Thank you for the assurance we have in your word, the confidence we have in the sacrifice of Jesus and the new life you offer us in him. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.